My name is Matt Pruitt. I'm the Deputy Director of Radical Exchange Foundation, and I'm very grateful to you all for being here today. So our first speaker, uh, Baratunde Thurston, is a person of many talents. He's a humorist, a futurist, a satirist, an activist, and just overall one of our most compelling public intellectuals. Uh, his resume is pretty unbelievable. He was a, uh, he's a former producer of The Daily Show. He's worked at The Onion. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, How to Be Black. He is the co-founder of Cultivated Wit. Uh, and he is a director's fellow at MIT Media Lab and an advisor to Data and Society. Uh, last year, he was the author of a piece on Medium called The New Tech Manifesto calling for a complete rethink of our relationship with data, along with many other excellent, engaging commentaries on the value of our data, our relationship with big technology companies, race, and many other topics. So please uh, give a warm welcome to Baratunde. We're so happy to have him. That made me sound real impressive. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you having me here. I think it's off to a great start. Um, Jeff, your introduction, incredible. Uh, I've never seen a leader uh, identify the key members of his constituency, praise and insult them. It was wonderful. It was just, you got to keep people on their toes. It was really nice. Um, and yeah, we're going we're gonna to be diving into a, a lot. But before we get there, I also want to welcome people who have come from other nations. I heard a lot of different languages on the shuttle, uh, so welcome to the United States. Uh, this means that you had to go through US Customs to get here. So you're survivors uh, of a kind. It also means when they ask you uh, what is the purpose of your visit, if you were honest, which you really should be, uh, you said I'm going to a gathering called Radical Exchange. <laughs> so that means for many of you, this is your last visit to the United States. <laughs> so again, welcome and goodbye. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here for 20 minutes. It's real good. Uh, before we get into the, to the meat of it, I just want to offer a resolution uh, while I have your attention. Uh, be it hereby resolved that due to extenuating circumstances, uh, Black History Month is taking March uh, this year. February was a, a garbage month. There was blackface and whatever's happening with Jesse Smollett, and I just, we need extra uh, to get this done. Uh, so happy Black History Month. That's not the subject of my talk, but it is an important public service announcement. And whenever I have the opportunity to address large crowds, I want to remind them to celebrate black people um, every month. So thank you for that. Snap, snaps. Those are, those are great to hear. Uh, so here's where uh, I come from in terms of technology and life. Uh, I come from this woman, my mother, uh, Arnita Lorraine Thurston. May she rest in peace. She was a computer programmer. Uh, who never graduated from college. She worked for the federal government of the US. She lived through a lot. She survived a lot, and she gave me and my older sister, Belinda, uh, a lot. She was an activist in the streets. This is a photo from 1968. She's the one in the middle staring at you for an as-yet-to-exist Instagram moment. Uh, I, I really appreciate the clarity of the sign in this poster, uh, because the 60s was an ambiguous time. A lot of things open to interpretation, and one might think that this gathering crowd was really a fan of imperialism, that they were down with imperialism. <laughs> but then you see the arrow, and you recognize in a college of design, it's important, uh, iconography and visuals, they want to reduce the supply of imperialism in the world, <laughs> which I'm for still, and I think most of us are for as well. So that's my mom uh, right there. Uh, she was committed to these ideas so much that the first book I remember having as a child uh, was a light uh, pamphlet uh, <laughs> called This is Apartheid, A Pictorial Introduction. So I was radicalized at a young age. Here is my middle school graduation photo. That'd be eighth grade, uh, 1989, with my sister and my mother. Uh, and, and during all of this time, uh, the computer was a really important layer and element uh, of my life. I had a computer in my house starting at age six, which would predate by about 15 years the moment I would have a girlfriend in my house. Um, no causation, just correlation. Uh, but we're bonded, me, me and the computer revolution. It unlocked economic potential for my mother, creative potential for myself. 
uh, and for my sister as well. Uh, and so I went on to have computer-infused jobs for The Onion, uh, even in the way that I wrote this book, uh, in my role at The Daily Show, and in the company you heard mentioned before, where we put on hackathons of a comedic nature, using technology for joy, art, expression, social critique, and not just profit. Um, and in that sort of summary of my life, I want to establish the context of what I'm talking about today, this new tech manifesto. Three years ago, I received uh, an award at the South by Southwest Interactive Conference. It was a, a Hall of Fame award, uh, almost a lifetime achievement award. I'm like, I'm not dead yet. You can't, you can't do that. Um, and in my remarks, I posed some questions and observations that I've continued to try to answer since. I want to share those with you as we dive in. The algorithms are coming, and we know they aren't pure or objective. Like journalists, they're embedded with the values of their makers. They reflect the society around them. But if innovation is all about making the world a better place, and the algorithms and code that claim to do so derive from this very imperfect world, sick with racism and sexism and crippling poverty, then isn't it possible that they might make the world a worse place? Could we end up with virtual reality racism? Could we have machine-learned sexism? Could poverty be policed by drones and an internet of crap? And since then, we have seen a series of headlines fleshing out this context, the idea that social media is being used to undermine democracy. Some latest massive organization has lost millions of sensitive records of its members. That internet service providers have been given a green light to sell our browsing history to the highest advertorial bidder. Uh, that machine learning algorithms still can't see black people. It's a devastating consequence sometimes. And that Facebook is on a non-ending apology tour for the latest democracy undermining offense out of that hellish shop. Uh, the stream of bad news is showcasing the far-reaching impact of how our personal data is used and misused. I say we're in a crisis, but I like to be positive. I'd rather see it as an opportunity. The same way I see the current US presidency as an opportunity to learn what an emolument is, or to read an indictment on a Friday night, <laughs> or to investigate other nations where I might live, nations like New Zealand, for example. Now, this moment of distrust in big tech gives us an opportunity to rewrite the rules, formal and informal governing, how the data we generate is collected, used, and valued. And when we rewrite those rules, we can write a different future for ourselves. Right now, we've got a few pioneering companies, big platforms, Facebook, Google, Amazon, extracting most of the value from the data that's being collected whenever we open our laptops, write an email, go anywhere with a phone in our pocket, take a photograph, talk to a smart speaker, yell at a smart speaker, scream again at a smart speaker because it didn't understand us the first two times. These organizations are using data to concentrate even more power and wealth along with it. Another example out of the apologetic Facebook organization, they've got early access to what we are using, what apps we are interested in, ahead of what their competition might see. They can see something trending before it's public information. They've used that early access to copy features or buy out competition before the rest of the world would know. This company is less of a social network than it is a data hoarding antitrust machine. We see this pattern, this power curve, applied to power itself. It's opportunity hoarding. Scale begets more scale and creates a nearly impenetrable barrier to entry. But in exchange, the argument goes, these companies give us free stuff, like photo storage, or messaging, or maps. But there's a lot more happening off the grid. Now, to resolve this, we could each take our own individual and personal steps. We could engage in the latest version of delete popular name service. We could install virtual private networks and live inside of homemade Faraday cages where we exchange information exclusively via encrypted USB sticks transported by armed carrier pigeons. <laughs> we could do that. But individual acts alone won't move the needle. They rarely do. 
Since companies value us collectively, we must restore balance with a collective response based on the view, the small d democratic view that we are in this together, that our rights and responsibilities are shared. So this talk is based on that medium piece I wrote last year, but I've updated it with some animated GIFs and some better pictures. I also had open sourced that piece, put it in an editable Google Doc. So what you're gonna hear today is a, an extended version based on the contributions of many others. It's a draft proposal for restoring balance and trust between the tech companies claiming to shape the future and we the people who want to live in it. We've got eight demands so far, but there'll probably be more than that, so let's jump in. Demand number one, offer real transparency and implement a trust score. Now real transparency to me means we should be able to see how our data is being used while we interact with the platform as easily as we can find out that someone liked our post or that new content we might like is available for consumption. That comment is directed at Netflix, which interrupts me constantly with shows I didn't think I wanted to see, like Murder Mountain. <laughs> Why does Netflix think I want to see Murder Mountain? Am I a likely murderer? Is it a hint? Is it a warning? Should you be nervous? I don't know. But we should understand from a data, extracting, a data extraction perspective, what's inside the tech products we use. We deserve to know clearly and upfront what companies are doing with our data, including how they're making money off of it, even if they're not selling the raw data themselves. Companies will often say, we don't sell your data, and that's a misdirection. A direct sale of a database of my information and behavior is not the only way to exploit me for profit. I prefer the idea and the term of monetizing my data, which includes indirect monetization, like using the data to extend my time on the service, which increases your venture capital valuation uh, publicly or, or privately. There's a writer for Wired UK who called Facebook a dual-headed beast that has for years been perceived by advertisers as a sophisticated tool for targeting customers, while users think it's a convenient way to keep in touch with friends. Real transparency means that we should be fully informed about both sides of that beast without having to read novel-length legal documents to do so. These companies constantly need to be re-earning our trust. And to do that, I propose they take a cue the food industry. Look, we don't individually drag chemistry sets to the grocery store in order to measure the nutritional composition of our food. Instead, companies are required by federal law to include standard nutrition labels on their products. And many now go much further to increase transparency and brand trust with their customers about how that food is brought to market. They tell us it's farm-raised, locally sourced, organically grass-fed, hand-massaged, string quartet serenaded, artisanal, vegan goat meat substitute food. <laughs> we need more of that. <laughs> Imagine something like a data usage label, or more broadly, a trust score that demystifies these terms of service, allowing us to easily understand if a service collects info about our friends, tracks our location, encrypts our records, or wipes our data at regular intervals. An anonymous contributor to this document fleshed out this idea of a trust much more than I ever did, writing, if companies can check our credit scores before doing business with us, we should be able to check company trust scores before doing business with them. For any of you familiar with the movie of the 90s, Higher Learning, this is the equivalent of, no, let me see your ID. That's for five of you, but I love you deeply. <laughs> Thank you, sis. Thank you, sis. I see you. Happy Black History Month. <laughs> Without getting into all the details which you can read in the doc, the score will be comprised of a bunch of different numbers, some from the Better Business Bureau or Consumer Reports, some from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, some for a mere legibility of the privacy policy to allow us to be much more informed. It would make it easier for us to make good choices and for companies to earn and maintain our trust. We don't want to live in a world where this slide is possible. The company Uber, way back in 2011, had this God view. They called it God view, which only an asshole would do. <laughs> you don't call it God view. That's so terrible. And they would pop this open at parties and track individual celebrity users in a city. 
We should not live in a world where that is possible. Now, I want to live in a world where companies are competing for our attention based on trust scores, based on who protects our data the best, rather than, bless you, rather than who can exploit it the most. It's a basic tenet of democracy that we need to be fully informed. That's true in ethical commerce as well. All right, number two, we demand a change in data defaults from open to closed. Defaults matter. I'm gonna guess that 90% of us don't change the default settings of our technology products within the first six months of using them. We sign up for a service, we trust the people who made it aren't out to rob us, but in fact, they're out to rob us. Most tech products grab as much data from as many users as possible, regardless of whether it's currently useful to them. They lay claim to something they assume will be valuable in the future. They assume we won't challenge them on it. Often we don't, because those choices are overwhelming. But in most, company, in most cases, companies don't need all the information they're sucking up just to run their service. What if they flipped the defaults? What if the data extraction defaults were as constrained as possible, taking a data conservationist approach? Mozilla offers a simple starting point through what it calls lean data practices. It's a win-win policy. It protects users and limits companies' liability because the less data they store, the less someone can steal from them. Remember the story of Kim Kardashian getting jacked in Paris, lost $5.6 million worth of jewelry? Because she had a lot of expensive jewelry. Her default fancy jewelry setting was way too high. <laughs> I, on the other hand, have never been robbed like that because I'm a fancy jewelry conservationist. I keep as few fancy jewels on me at any given time and lowering my odds of getting jacked. <laughs> My point is, these companies don't need to be sitting on all that loot. It's a liability, all right? Number three, we demand respect for our ownership over our data and the ability to move it with ease. Yeah, oh, that's good. People like data portability. We've got some real nerds in the house. I love y'all. I'm going to make a light legal proposal that we extend property rights to cover our data, both the data that we generate and the data that is derived from our activities, like our purchase history, our location, our interactions with the service, swipes, taps, clicks, and more. That's still created by us, in a sense. I'm talking about the data of us and the data about us. I'm talking about the content and the metadata. Without this, these services don't have anything to monetize. If Facebook doesn't know what you like or where you are or who you're communicating with, they know nothing. And without that data, artificial intelligence systems that are powering machine vision, speech recognition, and many other technologies of the future would best be called artificial stupidity. Now, I just want to do a quick aside on, on uh, CAPTCHA codes, uh, because I, I just got to say to Google, I have words for everybody, but to Google, I see what you're doing. This does not prove I'm not a robot. This is just training your robots to replace me. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not having it. Uh, if anything, I'm going to demand uh, you know, some shares of Waymo because I'm essentially a co-founder of the self-driving cars of the future at this point. Snaps and claps. I love This is my corner over here. This is great. When you understand that it's lots of user-generated or derived data that's powering the foundations of our future innovation and wealth, we become more than users. We become partners with rights to determine how our contributions are used and how the value created from them gets allocated. When we consider our true worth, Free photo storage and emails suddenly don't seem like a fair trade. With ownership comes portability. Gone should be the days of locking customers into your service by holding us hostage. My friends are my friends. My blog posts are mine. My photos are mine. And I should easily be able to migrate and use them on another platform, just like we have local number portability in our telecommunications life. Don't give me some super wonky JSON file Make it easy, make it usable, because it's mine and usability is about me. Now this is gonna be hard, it's gonna be complicated, but our current economy deals all the time in complex calculations previously unimaginable. Look at algorithmic stock trades, or digital copyright claims processes, or the fact that despite its best efforts, Netflix doesn't break the internet every single day. Now thanks to the surveillance economy we've built, we actually have most of what we need to account for the value of our data. All that remains 
is to recognize that it's ours and throw some big brains and big computers at that problem. Number four, we got to diversify who is at the table. The power of tech to shape the future of literally everything means that the people in the driver's seats, the entrepreneurs, the engineers, the investors, wield incredible power beyond the devices and the software they're launching into the world. But being a good software engineer does not qualify one to engineer all of society, all of politics, all of economics and beyond, not alone. I like to say that we've built a world in which antisocial people have built all our social tools. <laughs> the kid with no friends redefined the word friend for literally billions of people. <laughs> Technology is created by people and we have blind spots. We've got biases. Without more accountability, these human biases become machine biases with the potential to scale the worst parts of our nature. That's why tech companies need more diversity at the table. People who think differently about ethics, privacy, and tech's ability to facilitate abuse. This is one great organization called Project Include, which has come up with an entire rubric for measuring and pushing this industry forward. I highly recommend them. Number five, we have to imagine harder. We can't afford to be as surprised as we've acted over these past few years. This naive response of, well, I just thought people were good and never could have anticipated the Nazis would take over. That's what Nazis do. They take over shit. So you gotta build some protections and we are beyond the excuse of ignorance. It is inadmissible. We know humans can be trash. The potential is in all of us and history is littered with horrific examples proving the point again and again. So we need to push our imaginations to the darkest corners of possibility and ask, how can this technology be abused? then work to limit the cost of ending up on that path, not just maximizing the returns to the already rich dudes trying to get even richer. There's a great framework for posing these questions that's been put together by the Omidyar Network and the Institute for the Future. It's called Ethical OS, and I highly recommend you dive more deeply into that. They ask some very, very key questions that anyone in a position of power should ask, beyond technology even. If you've got power, you should be challenging yourself on your responsible wielding of that. Number six, we gotta break open the black box. Uh, even the most inclusive, multi-perspective, woke team with the darkest imaginations and the best of intentions cannot anticipate every outcome of its service before launch or ensure the least harmful outcomes after. These systems are too complex to see it all in one place. That's why we need more controlled access to these systems that opens them to independent inspections and audits. Again, I come back to food. It's a useful comparison. We have food inspectors. And when we have a functioning democracy again, led by a human being made up of more than ego and resentment, we will have a fully staffed and funded food and drug administration, which we'll depend on to make sure we're not consuming poison in massive quantities. We have inspectors for our financial markets in the form of the Securities and Exchange Commission or the Treasury Department. Again, once we restore our democracy. We need to establish a protocol for inspecting, understanding, and measuring the impact of what has for too long been a black box technology. We need to trust but verify. We've over-indexed on the trust. Now it's time to balance that with the verify. Number seven, we need to enforce new laws and old rules that are already on the books. We need a new regime and attitude around regulation. In 2011, the Federal Trade Commission reached a consent decree with Facebook and with Google and promptly failed to enforce it. And these two companies, eight years ago, started immediately violating the rules that they held themselves to and that we, the people in the form of our government, were supposed to be holding themselves to. Here's what the head of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, Mark Rottenberg, had to say about it. Essentially, we celebrated too soon. And almost immediately after those settlements, these companies started sliding on the commitments that they made. So I, uh, he said in one case that we don't have a data protection agency, which I found very inspiring. Uh, the idea, I'd love to have a data protection agency. I want them to have flak jackets, DPA on the front, 
I would join them. I would watch the episode of Cops where the camera pans across an open office floor plan of some tech company using aggressive data exploitation practices to push ads at us. And then I see five people crash through the roof and the windows brandishing smoke grenades and hex wrenches and magnets. Freeze, it's the DPA. Stop all data mining activities immediately. This is a raid. You're being investigated on suspicion of listening into people's smartphones in order to sell ads to them minutes later on Instagram. We know you've been doing it. <laughs> the jig is up. I want to watch that. I would pay to watch that, like on demand. It's possible that every government agency will need some form of data protection agency built into it. If your job is to enforce non-discriminatory civil rights laws, you've been looking at various arenas where that might pay out, where that might play out. You look at compensation. You look at hiring. You look at pricing. You look at, oh, I don't know, university admissions. Well, now that potential abuse of power and legal violation has taken place inside of the black boxes of proprietary tech companies, and we've got to open that up to make sure that they're not violating our civil, human, and legal rights as well. It's a natural evolution of what we expect in other domains, and there's good signs. Europe, again, welcome. Thank you for the GDPR. California, the people of the great republic of California, we're getting there. And most of these Democratic presidential candidates are calling for breaking folks up or taxing some activity or doing something to hold accountable this power, which, again, is the premise of a functioning and healthy democracy. Finally, number eight, we, we must be enabled to use, collect, analyze, and benefit from our own data. We can tip the balance of power between users and big tech companies with all this transparency, with a new framework on data rights, with stronger regulation, but we won't achieve true balance until we shift to what we do with this power, with this data itself. So far, mostly what we've done with the smartest people in the world and the most powerful machines ever assembled is we've used that great power to distribute ads. We've turned we the people into we the product. It's an underwhelming use of a superpower. It violates the basic rules of Spider-Man. And we can't let our stories stop there. It's got to continue with tech companies empowering us to collect and run our own analysis. We've seen hints of what's possible. Five years ago, I had access to a tool which let me see into my own following on social media to understand what my community members were interested in and better interact with them, the same way an advertiser is still well-serviced today. But that got shut down. We've seen justice pursued and richer stories of our past told due to technology. I point you to the Equal Justice Initiative, which has used big data and big tech to remind us of an intentionally forgotten story of racial terror lynchings in the United States. That's tech for use. Yes, one person cares about history. That's great or the Center for Policing Equity, which has built a national justice database. This is such an impressive and exceptional use of power for good to document and analyze the use of state power in the United States, which has been so disparate, to put it kindly, to understand how much race plays in the decision of a police precinct to use force against one of its citizens, and then to help unwind that. What asset does your tech create or collect? Who has access to it and to what ends is it being used? We should be using these powers much more for good and for the public. Here's a handful of recommendation. I'll have all this online later. Uh, ethicalos.org, you can find out more. I encourage you to do that. .everyone.co.uk, it's building some great stuff. Uh, the Data and Society Research Institute, based in New York, but covering a lot of the world, uh, and the AI Now Institute are, are both asking these questions and proposing creative answers. And then on the less wonky academic side, on the artist and creator side, uh, I got to give credit to The Verge, which put together this speculative fiction series that's kind of an inverse of Black Mirror. If Black Mirror shows us the world we don't want to live in, uh, they've employed science fiction writers to create a world we might actually want to live in through the power of story and fiction. Uh, so that's really, really dope. And then three books, uh, Winners Take Call by Anand Girdardas, uh, Decolonizing Wealth uh, by Edgar Villanueva, 
and the age of surveillance capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. Um, here's my, here's my, my closing. So we have this thing, this internet thing, this distributed thing, and its great promise wasn't that a few centralized powers would do everything for us. That's the old world, and we should not be trying to recreate that. The promise of an internetworked world is that we can do more ourselves under new models of collaboration, whether in the fields of science or art or justice. Imagine if we use that collective data to help us be better neighbors, better partners, better artists, better citizens, and better humans, rather than just better products to be auctioned off to the highest bidder. We've lived in a world where we auction people off. It is not one that any of us should want to return to. And imagine, too, if we could hold technology companies accountable by demanding they share power more equi equitably with the people who use and enable their products and services. Imagine it. Now, let's go build it. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, Wakanda Forever, very important. And a technical note, these slides are available. Uh, you can grab them from the website, or you can text a number and get it sent to you. Um, and if you want to be in a text message relationship with me, which you can totally opt into, uh, you can choose to do that. Otherwise, you know, stay free and clear and just go to the normal website and do that. Thank you again. Thank you, Radical Exchange. All right.